Heat emergencies are another environmental emergency that we will encounter uh, here in Alabama quite frequently, especially if we have supposedly falls like we have this fall with it being in the 90s and 100s. Um, there's three basic types of heat emergencies that our patients will have. One is a heat cramp, and I don't think we fully understand what causes some muscles to cramp. We think it may be due to the exertion, it may be due to electrolyte imbalances, but for whatever reason, they seem to be related with heat. And when a muscle cramps, of course, it's going to cause a very painful spasm. They're usually not going to be able to use the, use the extremity. And when you touch it or feel palpated, you may feel a knot there where the muscle is, is contracted. Um, generally, for these patients, we want to move them to a cooler environment, try to have them not use the cramping extremity if we can. We may do a little bit of massage to try to knead out that cramp a little bit. If they are still able to eat or drink, make sure that they drink some fluids, usually water or some sort of sports drink with some electrolytes in it. Um, stretch it a little bit. And generally, these are non-life-threatening. Um, but once the cramp is over, um, they should try to limit their exposure out in the sun in the heat. Now, we used to think that you had to have heat cramps before heat exhaustion, before heat stroke, and that's not true. Some patients never have heat cramps, but might go to heat exhaustion. And with heat exhaustion, your blood vessels have all dilated to try to lose the heat, to radiate the heat out of you. So you have a lot of blood that is in your skin um, and in the periphery and not to your brain, heart, lungs, and other vital organs. So it's almost like a, a form of mild shock and your body just gets very tired, worn down, feels tired, feels exhausted, maybe a little nauseated, might even be vomiting, um, maybe a little bit of confusion with heat exhaustion. The skin, because all the blood is dilated to it, um, and we're trying to lose all that heat, will typically very, be very sweaty, sometimes may look a little pale, and um, may be cool or warm to the touch. That's kind of what we used to think of, with, or what we think of with classic heat exhaustion, is that the skin is still uh, moist and might look a little, little pale. Generally, heat exhaustion is, is not a life-threatening thing if the patient is still able to drink fluids and we can move them to a cooler environment, remove any excessive clothing, um, loosen any clothing you can't remove, remove jewelry, um, fan them a little bit, sprinkle some water on them or put some water on them. If you can mist with some sort of like a little spray bottle, that's better than just dumping water on them. That way evaporation can help cool them off a little bit faster. And if they're still alert and oriented, um, generally they're going to recover pretty well from heat exhaustion. Now, if they can't eat or drink, or if the treatments aren't working and their temperature is continuing to go up, or they seem to be getting worse, then obviously we need to transport them to the hospital, especially if they can't, can't drink anything, because they're probably going to need IV fluids to help replenish what they've lost. Now, heat stroke is the most serious of these, and I kind of look at heat stroke as like decompensated shock, where heat exhaustion is they're still compensating. So in heat exhaustion, their body temperature is still staying fairly normal, 98, 99, 100, somewhere in that range. We start getting above 100, 101, 102, then we start thinking heat stroke, especially when we get up to those 104, 5, 6, 7s, and 8s. That's very, very hot. Um, typically, the body's lost the ability to sweat anymore at this point. So we go from a period where they were sweaty to where they're not sweating. So historically, we always said heat stroke was hot, dry, red skin although realize that they might still be sweaty from when they were in heat exhaustion and now the heat stroke is kicking in and the body temperature is going up. So that, that dry part may not always be true, but if you see someone that has the hot, dry, red skin, then you definitely start to think heat stroke. A lot of times with heat strokes, we're gonna have changes in mental status, so they become less responsive, unable to follow commands, can't talk very clearly, they may have seizures with it, and this is a true life-threatening uh, condition and these patients need to be cooled off as quickly as we can so a lot of times we recommend cooling them actually on scene so we're going to put them in a shower we're going to go into a pool keep their head above water um, we're going to turn a hose on them although you have to be careful that the water is not cold water but more of a tepid to cool type water and i know sometimes coming out of the hose it can be awfully cold um, so we want to make sure it's not too cold because that can actually cause shivering and cause some vasoconstriction and that will then um, prevent them from losing heat and they need to lose some heat. Uh, we can use cold packs to the groin, um, armpits, neck to help cool them off. And then of course, uh, if you don't have those available, um, trying to mist them, put some water on them, fan them, and move them to a cool environment, something that's air conditioned or the back of the ambulance is air conditioned. Again, just like with heat exhaustion, we want to remove any excessive clothing, remove jewelry, 
Um, position them if they're still conscious we can can have them sitting up but if they've gone unresponsive or unconscious then we're supposed to put them left lateral recumbent so they if they vomit which is, is common with heat heat exhaustion heat stroke they won't aspirate on it um, some people seem to feel a little better if we raise their feet up eight to ten inches twelve inches and that that may may work for them so if they feel more more comfortable with that feel like that's making them feel better that's fine um, and then transport to the hospital. Uh, of course, treat any injuries, make sure they're oxygenated well, watch your vital signs, watch your glucose levels. Um, and there's a couple of types of, of heated emergencies. There's the exertional ones, they were outside exercising or working hard and their glucose levels may be low. There's also more of an urban or non-exertional heat uh, emergency. And this is gonna be more of the elderly patient that's been in a hot house for days on end and didn't realize that their body temperature was going up. But that can be just as deadly as somebody that was outside roofing. Uh, but usually the non-exertional, we don't have to worry as much about the glucose levels. But check, check your blood glucose levels on anybody with an altered mental status. Watch your vital signs. And if we think heat exhaustion, um, see if they can have something to drink. If not, don't give them anything to drink. They'll just vomit it back up. Um, but heat stroke, don't give anything by mouth. We need to cool them off rapidly, usually about 10 to 15, 20 minutes on scene of cooling and then transport them to the hospital.